we have been going through the Gospel of Matthew and have been discussing different principles of uh, the concept of the kingdom of God and really looking at it from not only a theological perspective but also a practical perspective. And this morning we find ourselves in Matthew chapter 10. And that's a very long chapter, uh, so we're not going to read it all at one time. But we do want to see what we can pull from this particular scripture. Now, if you know your, your scripture well enough, you know that in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus was basically doing a lot of miracles, a lot of signs, a lot of wonders. And now in chapter 10, we see him calling out his disciples and giving them instructions to basically do exactly what he just did. So Jesus modeled, Jesus taught, Jesus trained, then he called his disciples and sent them out to do the same thing. Now, we are disciples of Christ, Christ so long as we call on the name of the Lord. If we have committed our heart to serving him, uh, we have committed ourselves to learning of him and knowing his ways, then we are disciples of Christ. And, and so we want to make sure that we understand what it means to be a disciple and what Jesus' expectations are for us. So let, let's go ahead and define that word right off the bat. What is a disciple? Here's the, 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 the basic nutshell that I can give you, is that a disciple is someone who has chosen to learn, follow, and demonstrate the teachings of Christ for life. You don't partially commit to Christ. You don't halfway commit to serving God, but you commit to it with your whole entire life for your whole entire life. Jesus made the statement that no man that put his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So one of the qualifying characteristics of somebody who is a kingdom citizen, somebody who is a disciple of Christ, is consistency and perseverance. They hang in now for the long run. Yes, they might make mistakes. Yes, they may fall short. Yeah, they may, they may mess up every now and then, but they keep getting up and they keep going on anyhow because they recognize that they are committed to this for life. God does not expect perfection. God expects progress. So sometimes, yes, we will make mistakes, but we have to learn from them and we have to move forward. So a disciple is someone who has chosen to learn, follow, and demonstrate the teachings of Christ for life. So when we look at uh, this, this Matthew chapter 10 and, and what it reveals to us about disciples, one of the very first things that, that, that this scripture points out to us is that the disciples were called unto him. The disciples were called unto him. And now when, when we look at that verse, it's, it's so subtle that it's, it's tempting to just read right past it. Watch this. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, the Bible says this, And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. So it's, it's tucked away in there so subtly that you can miss it if you're not paying attention to what you're reading. But, but the scripture indicates that when Jesus pointed out his disciples, that he called them unto him. And that's a powerful statement and a powerful notion uh, because we have to recognize that when we are disciples of Christ, we have to be called unto Christ, which means we have to abandon ourselves unto him. It's, it's not something that you can do 90%. It's not something that you can do 95%. It's not something that you can do 99%. Until we are talking about total abandonment, then we're not really talking about being committed to Christ. There has to be a point where we completely give it all up and say, I'm going to be totally and completely for him because we have to be called unto Christ. Uh, then the scripture said this, or rather another point I, I pulled from that scripture, that we cannot be called to ourselves, organizations, people, places or things the call must be to Christ and all else must be abandoned the call has to be the Christ and, and I, I want you to make sure you get that point right there because you, you're not called out to serve yourself it, it's, it's not really about you and I know that we live in a world where, where we, we think that we are very the center of the universe, that everything comes to us, that everything works our way, that everything is easy. And maybe while you're young in life, it might seem that way, but that's not reality. This whole kingdom thing is not really about you. It's really and truly about the king. So you're not called unto yourself. You're not called to fulfill your own purpose. You're not called to do things your own way. You're not called to fulfill your own agenda. You have to even give up the things that you want in order to follow Christ. Because as long as you're trying to serve God and still trying to serve yourself, you're going to create this dichotomy that you can't fulfill. You can't serve God's needs and your own needs at the same time until your needs come into alignment 
with his. And that's a whole nother sermon. You're not called to organizations. You're not called to Hollywood Christian School. You're not called to Hollywood Community Church. You're not called to your parents. You're not called to your friends. You're not called to those things. You have to be abandoned to Christ, and it has to be about Christ alone. So where does everything else come into place? Because obviously I'm not telling you that, that you can't love your parents. Obviously I'm not telling you that you can't love your friends. Obviously I'm not telling you that you can't love and be committed to your church, your school, your community. Obviously I'm not telling you that. What has to happen is that my commitment to you has to come through my commitment to Christ. That makes sense. I care about you the way I do because of my love for Christ. Because I can see how much he cares about you. So I can get up early in the morning and pray for you. I can spend hours getting ready to, to expel my gifts for you. I can do whatever it takes. I can bend over backwards. I can go all out of my way for you because I have seen the love that God has for you. And if God has that much love for you and I love him, then I need to love you the same way that he does. Can I get an amen right there? Amen. That's real love. And that love is greater than you being trying to be committed to somebody through human love. It would, human love would fail every time. But the love that God has and the love that God gives, the Bible says love never fails. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Human love will fail. I promise you, human love will fail you at some point. But the love of God working through a person will never fail. It'll never fall short. It'll always be there. So that's what we mean. We, we got to be completely abandoned to him so that I can be totally available for others. Because at the end of the day, my desire is to serve God. But God is going to serve you through others. God is going to minister to you through others. And so we have to be totally abandoned to him so that we can be totally abandoned for serving others. Not only that, but when we look at that same scripture, also we see that the disciples were not just called unto him, but they were given authority. The disciples were given authority. And you go back to that same scripture, Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. It said, and he called to him his 12 disciples. And the Bible says, and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. So here's another fine point that we have to make sure that we understand. Not only have we been called to this state of being abandoned to Christ, I, I can't love the world and love God. I can't sit in two chairs at, at one time. I have to sit in one or the other. So now that we've had this abandonment to him, we also have to understand completely that he has given us this authority to accomplish his will. And, and, and so many people don't do what God has called them to do because they fail to understand that one simple thing. They never accomplish much because they forget that one important principle about being a disciple of Christ. But, but Jesus gave them authority. So let's, let's take that word authority and let's, let's break it down. And I want to show you how you have it too. First of all, the word authority is just simply delegated power. Delegated means that it's something that was given, something that was proportioned for something else. So authority is delegated power. We need a power that doesn't really belong to you, but it is assigned to you from somebody that is over you. Jesus was over his disciples, and he gave them a portion of his power to accomplish the purpose that he had called them to. As a disciple, you have power. As a disciple, you have authority, but that authority has been given to you. It's not yours to do whatever you please. Do you remember when Jesus was out in the wilderness and the Bible says that Satan came and he tempted him for 40 days and 40 nights? You all remember that? Do you remember that there was one point where Satan knew that Jesus was fasting? Can you imagine fasting for 40 days, how hungry you would, you would be at that point? I mean, you, you skip breakfast and you feel like you're about to die, right? But can you imagine fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and at the end of it, somebody comes to you and remind you that you have the power to even take this stone and turn it into bread. And I'm, I'm telling you, if you have never fasted, if you've never fasted, 
when you get deep enough into a fast, stuff that you would never eat starts to look good to you. That stuff that you want to eat that you would never have eaten before. I, I never forget one time I was in college and, and I had been fasting and I pulled up at my job and it, I was there a little bit earlier so I was just sitting in my car. And I'm going to tell you something, I was hungry. I don't know how, how long it had been since I've been eating. I don't remember that much detail, but all I know is I was hungry. I, I, I wasn't hungry. That's, that's too cute. I was hungry. Man, I, I was so hungry to the point I was about to hurt somebody, seriously. And I was sitting there in my car at my job waiting for my time to go in and clock in. And, man, I looked out the window of my car, and, and there was a, a box of fries on the, on the ground. And somebody had run over the fries with that car. There was even tire tracks in the fries. Let me tell you something. In, in that moment, those fries looked so delicious. I, I don't know how long they had been there. I don't know, all I know is I was so hungry that a part of me wanted to eat them runt over fries right there off the ground. I was that hungry. So now, I wasn't fasting for 40 days, I can tell you that much. But now you talk about Jesus fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and Satan come to you and said, look at that rock. If you just turn it into a piece of bread, you can be happy. You can fulfill your hunger. You can forget all about this. You'll be all right. Just turn the rock into bread. That thing looked good. But Jesus said what? Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. See, some of us would be like, man, please, give me that rock. We would turn that rock into bread so quickly. But Jesus knew that him turning that rock into bread was not in accordance with what God wanted at that point. God wanted him to fast. He wanted him to fast. And so he did not break his fast even though he had the power to do it. There are things that you have the ability to do. There are things that you have the power to do. There are things that you have the authority to do that it's not time for you to do them yet. You don't have permission from God. Authority is delegated power. And when power is delegated, you have to use it in accordance with the one that delegated the power to you, or you will lose that power. Some of you are natural born leaders. Some of you are very good at influencing others. But you're using your power the wrong way. Instead of you using that authority, that influence that you have to motivate people, to move them, to do something great and do something wonderful, to do something for somebody else, you use that influence to mess up your teacher's classroom. You got to be the clown. You got to be the one to get all the attention. You got to be cutting the food. You got to be doing all this stupid stuff. Look, man, you are a leader and you are abusing your power. You were born to, to influence other people. You were born to motivate others, but you are abusing your power. This is why we have to have knowledge of this stuff. Because where knowledge is absent, abuse is inevitable. Some of you young ladies will grow up and you'll one day have another young man in your life. Before you let that young man too deeply in your life, let me tell you something. You better make sure he has God's knowledge of how a woman ought to be treated. Because if he does not have knowledge of how God wants women to be treated, that man at some point in his life will abuse you. You laugh now, but I'm telling you this is serious. If he doesn't know God, he's going to eventually abuse you. Whether it's emotional abuse, whether it's through neglect, or whether it's through physical abuse, he's going to abuse you. And men, you're not exempt. Watch who you let in your life. Because if people don't have knowledge of you, and they don't have knowledge of God, and have knowledge of his love, eventually that girl is going to begin to abuse you. No, she may not give you a black eye, but she will hinder your life. She will slow you down. You're trying to accomplish something. You're trying to be somebody. You're trying to do something with your life. And she's so ghetto that you can't do nothing. She will hinder your life. Why should you let in that inner circle of your life? Because if they don't have knowledge of you and your purpose and God's plans for who you are, they're going to hinder you. We'll talk more about that later. Authority, my point I'm making, is delegated a power. Power, then, when power is properly defined, power is simply the ability to achieve purpose. See, we think power has to do with position, but it doesn't. Power has nothing to do with position. Power has nothing to do with wealth. Power has nothing to do with your social status. 
Power is simply the ability to achieve purpose. In other words, when a purpose is set in your mind, can you accomplish it? No matter how small, no matter how big, can you get it done? Doesn't matter the size of it. When you set purpose in your heart, when there's something in you that you feel like you've got to accomplish, can you do it or do you fail every time? If you can accomplish purpose, you're a powerful person. If you can set a conviction in your heart and achieve that thing which you're convicted over, you are a powerful human being. I'm telling you, if you can set goals and achieve them, you are one powerful individual because most people can't do that. Most people give up when it's not easy anymore. Most people quit and they split because they're not good at something. I'm not talking about basketball, but if the shoe fit, wear it. Most people fail to achieve purpose because they lack power. Power is simply the ability to achieve purpose. If you can achieve goals, if you can achieve the thing that's in your heart, I'm telling you, you're a powerful individual, you're going to be a boss. You're going to be somebody that leads others. You're going to be people that build organizations. You're going to be a person that accomplishes great things because most people can't do that. It, it, it sounds simple, and it is simple, but it's not easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. Most people can't do it. So if you ever figure it out, if you never get to that point where, where, where you're here and your goal is just beyond your grasp and you figure out how to get it, you're going to become a powerful individual because people will want to follow you because they're going to want to know, how can I do what you're doing? How can I be as great as you? What are the secrets that you know in life? What's your knowledge? What's your wisdom? What's your understanding? How did you figure it out? This is why people followed Jesus. This is why he had thousands of people following him everywhere that he went. Because they recognized that Jesus had something that they didn't have. Jesus was a powerful individual. He could accomplish any purpose he set his mind to. Learn to achieve your goals. Learn to achieve the things that God has placed in your heart. Learn how to do it no matter what your, your reason is for not doing it. Some of you come up with all kinds of excuses, man. Oh, my, my, my daddy ain't in my life. So what? Your daddy ain't God. I went my whole life without my daddy in my life. So what? Some people's daddies are dead. Figure it out. Stop making excuses. My mama was never there for me. My parents were broke. I, I, can't, I can't do anything I want to do. I don't have the clothes that they have. I don't have the car that they have. So what? Figure it out. Man, we can make excuses all day long, but powerful people figure it out, and they don't make excuses, nor do they feel sorry for themselves. Figure it out. Power properly defined is the ability to achieve purpose. Here's something else. These disciples were given authority to fulfill a specific purpose at a specific time. They were given authority to fulfill a specific purpose at a specific time. Here's something else. We have been given authority specific to our functions. So here's, here's another reason why you can't get those pieces to connect, why you're having a hard time figuring it out. Because there's something in your heart you want to achieve, and that there's something in your heart that, that you want to accomplish, but it, it just don't seem to be connecting. You know, just as much as I encourage you to go after your dreams, to dream big, to build small, and to never be satisfied, let me tell you something about being young, <laughs> and, I, and I'm thinking about myself, not about you. Sometimes your dreams are stupid. Sometimes you need to get another dream. Sometimes you need to do something else. But their wisdom in knowing when I need to keep going forward and when I need to change directions. 
There's wisdom in knowing, although I want to do this, there's obviously, obviously something better that God has for my life. I told y'all, my, my passion, my dream, my desire, my one focus, my one focus when I went to college was I wanted to be a computer engineer. That was my one focus. And, and, and get this, get this. I had the ability. I still have it. I had the desire. I had the faith that I could do it. Everything was in place. But something was wrong in my heart that would not let me settle it. There was something in me that, that just said, you know what, this is just not what God wants you to do. And I couldn't explain it because I, I should have been making a six-figure salary right out of college, and I, I don't understand why I just couldn't settle for that, why that just wasn't enough. Why was I still hungry for something more? I, I didn't understand why, e even though I had all of this ability, all of this intellect, and I was right there in my junior year of college, just one more year and I'm out of there. And something moves in my heart and says, this isn't the way God wants you to go. There's a better way. There is a better plan. And I'm telling you, the moment I made that change, the moment I flipped that switch and let God step in control, I abandoned my own desires and I said, God, whatever you want. Whatever you desire, whatever your plan, I will follow you. I'll do what you call me to do. I'll say what you tell me to say. And I go. You tell me, by the way, I never wanted to come to Florida. I never wanted to come to Florida, ever. I had friends down here that tried to get me to come to Florida for years, and I never wanted to do it. But, you know, I reached another point in my life, not so long ago, where I said, you know what, God? Even though I don't want to teach in the state of Florida, because I don't like the way the state of Florida treats their teachers, even though I don't want to teach in the state of Florida, if you tell me to go, I will go. Amen? All right. We'll finish this next week. Father, we thank you so much for your presence. We thank you so much for your power. We thank you so much for your love. We thank you so much for how amazing you are to us. Father, will you remind us that we have to be completely sold out for you? Will you remind us to be abandoned to you and to you alone? Give us the courage and the strength and the ability to be able to lay everything aside except you. Father, I pray for every individual in this room that you will multiply and increase them in every way. May your kingdom be evident in their lives. May they demonstrate your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'll see y'all next week.